Yeah. It's, it's going. Good. So we'll cross our fingers at last. So, um, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kiana Washington. I am a local criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney focusing on conditions of confinement. I'm also a certified uh, criminal law specialist of the state bar. And um, today we are going to be talking about um, different ways to suppress evidence. Um, and I will later be joined by Ashley, who will be doing part of the, the presentation as well. You have my contact information here and we'll make the slides available um, after this seminar. Okay, so what we will cover today are statements, exculpatory evidence, informants, search warrants, which are generally part of informants, although not always, uh, remedies for denials if you lose your motion. What we will not cover, what I will not cover, um, but I don't believe Ash is covering this either, uh, basics, um, nuts and bolts, searches incident to arrest, inventory searches, prolonged detentions, uh, de facto arrests, probation, parole, searches, stop and frisk, pat searches, consent searches, any other warrantless searches. So the purpose of this uh, talk is to kind of get into a little bit more of the advanced um, level suppression issues that people often overlook. I think that typically people are aware of and, and focus on the things that are on this list, but um, we kind of want to go a little bit beyond the basics. Um, in my practice, for sure, I haven't been dealing with a lot of the warrantless type of detention issues. Um, a lot of my stuff lately, for sure, deals with um, warrants and, and other types of things that um, I just don't want people to feel discouraged. You know, if you see that your case has a warrant, that doesn't mean that you should just be like, well, now we're screwed. Um, there are many different ways to, uh, to deal with search warrants and defects in search warrants. Um, so we're just gonna go over that. But in addition to that, um, we're gonna start with statements. This is also something that people often overlook. Um, one, and in, in, in by people, I mean sometimes judges often overlook. Um, and I've definitely had judges when I bring up a suppression issue. In fact, I, I remember specifically doing a 1538.5 to suppress my client's very damaging statement. And I remember at the end, um, this was in San Francisco, of our motion, the judge uh, said to me, what a waste of time when he um, denied my motion and then I got him reversed. So um, you can definitely suppress statements um, on Fourth Amendment grounds. It's not limited, suppression of statements are not limited to Miranda, um, but we are gonna talk about Miranda issues um, and how that comes about because I've seen some confusion on that as well, um, kind of in the opposite vein. I've seen, you know, gone to suppress statements, say at preliminary hearing, and had the judge say, well, there's no 1538.5 filed in this case. And it's like, well, that deals with the Fourth Amendment versus the Fifth Amendment. So we're not really in the same amendment um, when, when we're talking right now. Um, so there's just a lot of confusion about this. And if there's confusion on the bench, there might be confusion from practitioners, hopefully not. But um, so kind of starting with the elements of a Miranda um, case, uh, situation, and we're, we're also going to be talking about things that are kind of less likely to be considered. Um, so yeah, you know, obviously, if your cop didn't give the warnings, like I think everybody's gonna figure out that that's an issue, right? But we're talking about some of the lesser known issues. Um, so first, I mean, clients, as I'm sure everybody here knows, I mean, nobody that does criminal defense has um, escaped 
that conversation where you have a client come in and say, well, they didn't even read me my Miranda rights. <laughs> okay, it's not like TV uh, where they just read that as soon as they put the handcuffs on you. Um, if say you weren't arrested, um, there's, there's that, um, you know, maybe you got arrested, um, by, you know, some sort of indictment or something like that. Um, and you have to be under arrest, deprived of a freedom of action in a significant way or reasonable person in a suspect's position would not feel free to leave. And the citations are up on the screen there. Um, but this also includes, this is one of my favorite cases, uh, People versus Pilster. Um, this also includes de facto arrests. Um, and so that's common. Um, I know, Derek, you do a lot of DUI cases. That's common in cases like that, where they just put the handcuffs on and they say the person's not really under arrest. They're being uh, detained for investigatory purposes. Well, that's what happened to Mr. Pilster. And so then they start questioning him thinking, well, he's not under formal arrest. I told him he was not under arrest, but he's, he's, he's on, he's wearing hand or he's wearing handcuffs. He has handcuffs on him. Um, I think they also made him sit on the curb and then they start questioning him. Um, and so the Pilster case said that that was a de facto arrest and he was they were required to read him the Miranda warnings. Um, here's another situation. This came up for me uh, recently when the police served a search warrant on my client's home. And then of course they went to chat with him. He wasn't under arrest um, because it was just a search warrant. It was not an, a search and arrest warrant. It was not an arrest warrant. And so the prosecution's arguing, the judge is arguing, um, the police are arguing that, well, he wasn't under arrest and he was in his own home. So we didn't have to give him the Miranda warnings. Well, that's, that's not true. This case is actually a case from 1969, this Orozco case. There are some other cases. And so it's, it's kind of fact dependent. So don't just assume because your client was at home that, um, you know, this is going to apply. You kind of need to look at the, the circumstances. Um, this, this case is actually fairly short. Um, and so I believe it's like Justice Black, I want to say, um, rendered the opinion. But um, this gentleman was, in, Mr. Orozco was in his bed um, and the police, you know, burst in at four o'clock in the morning serving a warrant which, I mean, I think many of you probably are thinking, well, you know, that's kind of early. They need a special authorization to do um, kind of a nighttime warrant is what that would be considered. Um, but they came in, they surround him in his bedroom, you know, obviously they're armed and all that, and they question him and they, they didn't believe that they needed to provide him with the Miranda warnings. But um, this Orozco case says that they did. Um, interrogation, I actually, believe it or not, had a judge say, well, they didn't like actually interrogate them, but the definition of interrogation is express questioning or functional equivalent. Um, any words or actions on the part of the police that the police should know are reasonably likely to elicit an incriminating response. Um, so this is kind of also where our clients get confused and they say, well, hey, you didn't e they didn't even give me my Miranda warnings. It's like, well, they didn't ask you any questions. So, you know, like they didn't really need to, but there are times when they make statements, like the police make statements um, that can make a, a um, conversation, let's just call it, turn that into an interrogation. So many of you probably are familiar with the Christian burial speech. Um, that's something that I specifically remember from law school. Um, basically, they're driving around with a suspect and they're like, oh, doesn't this person who had been murdered deserve a, a Christian burial? And the, the um, accused was saying, you know, was religious and that prompted, and they knew that, the police knew that, and that prompted the, the person to go ahead and confess. Um, and so Brewer versus Williams holds that 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 was um, 
reasonably likely to elicit, that comment was reasonably likely to elicit an incriminating response. Um, in the uh, Rhode Island versus Innis case, um, that has to do with telling somebody, oh, a child might find a weapon. Like, I think it was a gun that was outstanding. And they prompted, like, the Mr. Innis to, to make an incriminating statement um, because, you know, out of fear that, well, we don't want anyone to get hurt, right? Um, and then some FST questions in Pennsylvania versus Munoz. Um, this deals with estimating 30 seconds um, in the Romberg. That's a 1990 case. Um, and then, you know, something that people, this is also one of my favorite cases, Missouri versus Siebert. Um, came out the year I graduated from law school, so I remember it well. Um, these question first tactics, um, I have seen that come up in. Um, in police work uh, with our clients where they go ahead and just get all this incriminating stuff when they um, are at least under the impression that they didn't need to, to Mirandize the person and then they don't give them the warnings before that and then give them the warnings afterwards and have them repeat everything they just said. Um, the Supreme Court says that no, no bueno on that either. Um, Miranda admonitions. So this is something that, that often gets overlooked. Um, so I would definitely just check and make sure, um, in modern times, we, we often see it recorded. Um, so check and make sure they did it right. Um, you don't want to overlook this because it's like, well, yeah, you know, what idiot can't give Miranda admonitions? I think all of us that grew up in the United States have heard those admonitions on TV a gazillion times. And so why the cops can't get it right sometimes is just mind boggling. Um, it's also mind boggling when they need to testify by reading their card because it's like, you should know that in your sleep because you say it a lot. But also we, we hear it so many times in pop culture. If you can't repeat that, like I, I, I kind of question what you're doing. Um, so the waiver expressed or implied, um, a lot of times what they end up doing is they don't even bother to ask people to waive anything anymore. Um, I, I have a video um, in, a, in a moment um, where they do have like a, <clears throat> a representation of an expressed waiver with a form. I haven't seen that um, outside of San Francisco lately. Um, San Francisco, I, I'm a former public defender from San Francisco, they were, SFPD has been very big in getting people to, to write out a formal waiver. Um, they have a lot of forms there. But outside of um, San Francisco, they, a lot of times they'll just launch into the questioning, which kind of puts our clients off guard because they're expecting to, to be asked to waive something. And I think to some extent, psych psychologically, they're thinking, oh, well, they didn't actually ask me to waive it. So if I just ask these questions, maybe my lawyer can do something. Um, what I have also been doing, and this is definitely something you don't want to overlook, um, and this is a benefit of being in private practice that our public defender brethren do not enjoy which is a lot of times, um, especially during the pandemic, I've, I've seen a, a huge uptick, uptick in people who are under suspicion of, of a crime. They become aware of it. The cops try to contact them or somebody accuses them of something and they know the cops are called. And so then they contact a lawyer right away. Um, that is a wonderful opportunity. And as a policy in my firm, we have a letter that we submit directly to the investigating officer detective. Uh, we make sure that, you know, if we can email it, if we can fax it, if we can have it delivered, um, you know, with certified mail. Um, I've actually hand delivered it and had, on a rape case, I had the um, investigator to sign it, acknowledging it. Um, and so it's just an invocation saying that this person is represented by counsel. They do not wish to speak to you about anything related to your investigation. And they wish that I be contacted before you even try. Um, 
whether this will work in court, I don't know, is certainly in every single case, and we're talking serious cases, we're talking um, a lot of sexual assaults, child molestation, all kinds of, of, of serious cases, um, it freaks them out. The police get freaked out. And so they don't want to waste their time getting some confession when they're like, I don't know if this is even going to hold up in court. Um, and so that shuts down any attempt to um, interrogate your client. Um, and I've had cases where they just straight up didn't get filed. You don't want to put your client in a position of going up against the cops. They're not equipped to handle that, no matter how educated they are. Um, I've seen police officers that were suspected of serious crimes think that they can go it alone in an interrogation, and it doesn't work. Um, and you have a greater likelihood of getting your case um, either not filed or um, having a positive outcome in your case if your client doesn't make a statement. I mean, that's just common sense for all of us who practice. And so if you have the opportunity to have a client come in and um, in advance of being arrested and let the, you know, the investigators know that they're represented in a formal way, you want to do that. There's also some case law that says that um, kind of dealing with the uh, Sixth Amendment right to counsel issue that kind of distinguishes private attorneys from public defenders. It's really not fair. Um, and it's something that I researched when I um, took on a court appointed case that nobody locally in San Joaquin wanted to take on. And so I came in from out of county and handled it. And our, my client wasn't super sharp. And so even though he had counsel um, on one, you know, case, they, they wanted to get him on some other allegations. And so they went in and questioned him about that. And the judge ruled, well, that's not the same, like, even though they really were very much connected, um, it's not based on the same charges that were before the court. And we found out, um, much to our chagrin, um, that if he had had a private attorney, that um, was representing him. Um, the fact that it wasn't on the same exact topic of the charges that had been filed would have been helpful. But because it was a court appointed counsel, then that made, that was the pivotal difference that meant that his statement um, was allowed to come in. And these are things, again, that we just don't think about um, because they, you know, maybe come up here and there, but they're, they're going to be important things. And since we're, we have a bunch of private attorneys in this group, um, I would definitely encourage you to do it for them. Um, one possibility, if you're really concerned that, you know, this is not going to be read as an invocation by them, is to just have them sign the letter too. I just write it like they, my client has advised me that he or she wants to, um, wants to um, invoke their right to counsel and their right to remain silent. Um, but a stronger way to do it, if at all possible, is just have your client sign the letter too. And so then you don't have to worry about some judge coming in and saying, okay, but it's not from the client, it's from you, the attorney. Um, so challenge these statements early and often. Um, when they try to bring it in at prelim, I would challenge it then, and I always challenge it then. Um, and so I did have, I think it was in January, um, a case where the judge was like, well, I couldn't find any case that allows you to challenge this statement at prelim. Um, challenge it based on Miranda. Um, but this treatise says that the the judge, I think it might have been Justice Simons, doesn't think that this would be the proper venue. I'm like, okay, that's not binding law at all, but okay, with all due respect to Justice Simons. Um, but if they try to bring in a statement and they haven't established, um, meaning the prosecution hasn't established um, the elements of, of the Miranda decision, I would object right then and there. Um, 402 hearing, it's mandatory. 
It's shall, the court shall hold a hearing. I've talked to other defense attorneys who did not know that. Read evidence code section 402. Um, and also I like to do these motions, especially for trial. I mean, not necessarily, that's kind of a lot of work to do for prelim, but you know, if you think that you have a chance um, to get your client's statement thrown out and thus maybe the case, that's how weak the case is, um, at prelim, then go for it. If you, it, it's just making a better record, but it, it's not required. Um, like I said, I have had judges get really confused and say, well, there's no 1538 uh, filed. And it's like, well, that's not really the issue we're dealing with. Um, so it doesn't need to be in writing in any way. Um, there doesn't need to be any kind of notice. Um, and I skipped over this, which is kind of funny because I included involuntary statements in here because I did not want to skip over that. Um, but that is something that people often don't think about. They're focused on Miranda and they're not focused on the voluntariness of the statements. Um, in my very first job out of law school, I worked on a case where we were challenging not the statements of our client, but the involuntary statements of witnesses. Um, and so what you want to do is not overlook the, the due process rights that our clients have to have um, evidence that is voluntarily given, statements that are voluntarily given. Um, there are also issues with um, eyewitness identification. You know, if you have some sort of taint issues like that, don't overlook that. Any type of evidence that you're looking at that's like, I don't like that. Don't just assume it comes in. Um, look at it in terms of like, what can we do about that? Is there something wrong with that statement? Is it somehow involuntary? Is it somehow tainted? Um, so you can address it. Um, the prosecution needs to, for, when you're talking about your client in particular, the uh, prosecution needs to, um, establish that the statements were voluntarily given. Um, if the prosecution fails to do that, then it's not admissible. And I have had a statement of my client thrown out at trial on that basis. Um, it was in San Francisco, so I'll have put that, that asterisk in there. It wasn't here. But um, you, know, you at least wanna make that record for sure. Right to the suspect. Give me your thoughts. You are a citizen of a free nation. Having lived your adult life in a land of guaranteed civil liberties, you commit a crime of violence, whereupon you are jacked up, dragged down to police headquarters, and deposited in a claustrophobic ante room containing three chairs, a table, and cold brick walls. Have a seat, please. And there you sit for a half hour or more until a homicide detective, a man who can in no way be mistaken for a friend, enters the room. He offers you a cigarette, not your brand, and begins an uninterrupted monologue which wanders back and forth for a half hour or so, eventually coming to rest in a familiar place. You have the right to remain silent. You have got the absolute right to remain silent. Of course you do. You're a criminal. Criminals always have the right to remain silent. We're talking about sacred freedoms here. Notably, your Fifth Amendment protection against self-incrimination. Hey, if it was good enough for Ollie North to Mark Berman, who the hell are you to incriminate yourself at the first opportunity? Get it straight. A police detective paid government money to put you in prison is explaining your absolute right to shut up before you say anything stupid. You see, any time you say a lie, it's being used against you in court of law. Yo, Bucky. Wake up. Talking to a police detective in an interview room is only a lunch. If it may help, it's pretty good to tell you that. Stand up and tell you you have a right not to worry. Anything you say you're right will be used to help you in a court of law. Your best bet is to shut up. Shut up now. You see, you have the right to talk to an attorney at any time. Before any questions, before answering any questions, or during any questioning. Now, the man who wants to arrest you for violating the peace and dignity of the great state of Maryland says that you can talk to a trained professional, an attorney, 
who has read the relevant code, or if he's got his hands on some cliff notes. Let's face it, pal. You just carved up some drunk in a Dundalk Avenue bar or bludgeoned your wife to death with a pickaxe. That don't make you a brain surgeon. You're going to need the help of an expert. Believe me. Take whatever help you can get. He's right. You're focusing on when you first sit down with a suspect. The detective has informed you of your rights. He wants you to be protected, he says, because he says there's nothing that concerns him more than giving you every possible assistance in this very confusing and stressful moment in your life. The detective wants you to know, and we've been doing this a lot longer than you have, so you can take our word for it. Your rights to counsel aren't all they're cracked up to be. Once you actually up and call for that lawyer, son, there ain't a damn thing we can do for you. No, sir. Your good friends in the homicide unit are going to have to lock you all alone in this room. And the next authority figure to scan your case will be a no-nonsense prosecutor from the Violent Crimes Unit with the official title, Assistant State's Attorney for the City of Baltimore. And God help you then, because a ruthless bloodsucker like that will have an O'Donnell Heights motorhead like yourself halfway to the gas chamber before you get three words out. Your best bet is to speak up. Speak up now. And a man who wants to put you in prison, a man who is not your friend, he comes in and he says, uh, black with sugar, right? Yeah, the, the coffee's fine, man. Um, what, what happens if I want a lawyer, huh? What? Then we'll get you a lawyer. That ain't no problem at all. I've got a pocket full of lawyers out there. But, but, maybe you should think first. Hmm? Think. Because, see, this is your opportunity to tell me what really happened. Right. He came at you, didn't he? He came at you. He was scared. Who would blame you? It was self-defense. Your mouth opens to speak. He came at you. Uh-huh. You venture cautiously. Whoa, 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 whoa. Before we do that, I got to get you your rights forms. Rights forms, rights forms. That's the problem with them things, huh? There's never any around when you want. It's like a cop, right? <laughs> Um, I'm willing to answer questions and I do not want any attorney at this time. My decision to answer questions without having an attorney present is free and voluntary on my part. You stand the bottom of the form. The detective looks up at you, eyes soaked with innocence. Can't imagine. You know. Yeah. He, um, yeah, he, uh, he came at me. Your history. And if I wasn't so busy writing up your statement, I'd probably tell you so. I'd say, son, you are ignorance personified, and you just put yourself in for the murder of a human being. I might even admit to you that after all my years working murders, I'm still a little amazed that anyone utters a word in this room. Think about it, son. When you came through those doors, what did the sign say? Homicide unit, that's right. Who lives in a homicide unit? And what do homicide detectives do for a living? You got it, Bunk. And tonight, you took somebody's life. So when you opened your mouth, what in God's name were you thinking? That was actually my favorite Miranda admonition of all time. Uh, that's from Homicide Life on the Street. It's a TV show from the 90s, precursor to The Wire, for all those uh, of you who know The Wire, um, made also by David Simon. Okay, so let's talk about exculpatory evidence and its destruction. This is also something that's commonly overlooked um, I most recently dealt with this over the summer um, when the police decided to selectively record my client's statements. Um, and so you'll see the, the case law over here on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it's important to remember it has to be bad faith failure to preserve exculpatory evidence when the evidence, the exculpatory value of the evidence is evident. Um, and so, you know, things like, you know, for example, in my case, my client was denying a bunch of um, 
serious allegations, child molestation allegations. And so they took it off camera and they said that he admitted all these things. And so um, the case ended up getting dismissed, um, which is great. But, you know, our position is they knew he was denying it the whole time. And so they just cut out additional denials. What this can do for you is actually get your case dismissed. Um, and so, I mean, because it's not like, well, we'll just exclude the exculpatory evidence. Obviously, that's not going to help. Um, so if this evidence it has been lost, um, and I think one of the cases that we came across dealt with um, video footage. Um, the, the client had told the police, check the video, check the video, check the video. And they just let the video go. They didn't bother to collect it, which is common practice by the police. Um, the court held that they couldn't continue with the case because the, the video, um, you know, the defense position was the video would have showed that um, the client didn't do anything. And without all of that, and the, the cops were on notice that the video was um, exculpatory and they failed to preserve it on purpose. Um, so the case was thrown out. Um, so and I think that case was a robbery case. So if you have situations like that, where, you know, say your client tells you like, look, I denied everything to them. I told them I never did this, whatever, and they didn't bother to record it. I would definitely explore this. I mean, there's no downside to bringing emotions like this. The only, the only thing that could possibly happen is you could win. Like no one's afraid of winning, right? So next let's move on to snitches. Um, or informants if you're polite, which I'm not. Um, so this is also something that I have, let's see if I can get this out of my way. Hey, Kim, um, before you, before you start, just so you know, Ashley's here. So, okay. okay. I can't see everything on here, but okay. 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 Um, so, uh, evidence code section 1042C. Um, says that at PX, criminal trial or other criminal proceeding, so you can challenge this, you know, in a variety of different proceedings. You don't need to wait until trial. Um, and sometimes, especially locally here, they'll say, well, that's a trial motion. Like, well, says who? And the code, certainly not the code. Um, when challenging the reasonable cause to search or arrest, um, again, I've used this to actually get my case thrown out. So you don't want to overlook this. And I do remember a specific ju judicial officer talking to me like I was stupid and didn't bother to read the code. And then that's how I got my case thrown out because um, I brought this up at preliminary hearing. Um, who? The confidential informant, but not a material witness to guilt or innocence. So this is not the section dealing with um, guilt or innocence witnesses. Um, we'll deal with that later. And what um, the reliability has to be established in open court. And um, that's one of the things that went wrong in my case. They're like, no, we're just going to have an in-camera hearing. You don't get to ask any questions. You can submit questions. The, the judge was completely confused as to the procedure. And you'll see why in a moment, because there's so many different um, ways this goes down. And the motions are confusing. Even when I was writing the, this up, I was like, okay, which one is this again? Um, so that kind of brings us to search. Mode. Okay, so these motions are very confusing, like I said, but let's just break them down into what they do. So there's a Hobbs motion, which most people have heard of. It's a motion to unseal a search warrant or affidavit or portions thereof. You have the citation right there. When it's sealed to protect a CRI, a confidential informant, um, does not reveal the, C the CRI. Uh, file a 1538.5 motion is how you get there uh, in camera review um, either at the hearing or before DA and Affian appear on the record. Um, defense uh, counsel is not um, there or defense, you know, the defense at all. Um, defense can submit questions though. 
Um, so it's contrary to that, um, the other one that we just went over, where that has to be done in open court. Uh, Lutenberger motions. So this deals with a motion to disclose documents related to the CRI's veracity or reliability in the form of documents, police reports, um, anything else that might undermine the informant's credibility. The defense must make a preliminary showing that the affidavit includes substantial factual assertions casting doubt on the accuracy of the affiant statements. Only the prosecution, the cop are present on the record does not, this also does not in, reveal the informant's identity. But CRI motions, um, which a motion to disclose the identity of the informant, those would get you the identity of the informant or a dismissal if they don't wanna give that up, which you know commonly is the issue. So this, in this case, the informant needs to be a material witness on the issue of guilt or innocence. Um, hearing is an open court where both sides can present evidence. The defense must show reasonable possibility the informant might have exonerating testimony. For an example is a percipient witness um, to the incident, um, but you know, you have to show that, that they're not just a percipient witness, they would be an exonerating witness as, as well. Um, if um, 1041 of the evidence code is claimed, that's, that's basically um, a privilege, a official government privilege. Um, then there's an in-camera in hearing if the defense wins, disclose the identity of the informant or um, dismiss the case. And there's the code section. Then there's a motion to quash, which is based on 1538.5 AB, facially invalid warrant, lacks probable cause, et cetera. A traverse, which is also known as a Frank's motion, um, that deals with lies, half-truths, frauds. The burden's on the defense to make a substantial preliminary showing. Um, and so what I would say, especially with the Frank's motion, like if there's a, if there's a warrant at all, the burden's on the defense. Um, and so don't show up the same way you would in a regular 1538, thinking that the DA has to prove something. You have to prove something in order to prevail um, if there's a search warrant. Um, you can't just say like, yeah, this is just a bunch of lies. It can't be conclusory. It looks beneath the surface of the search warrant, which I've had judges say, well, we're just going to look at the four corners of the search warrant. Like that's like, how are you going to prove that they're lies? Like they wrote the lies down and those lies, are, like they don't write down these are lies on the search warrant. Um, and the defense can only have an evidentiary hearing if the preliminary showing is made. Special considerations, if property is taken that is not described in the warrant, it must be returned. Um, if they take what's, if they search what's beyond the warrant, um, that's, that's a basis. Um, then there's a discovery provision. Have you ever wondered how many judges they went to before they got a judge to sign your warrant? Well, you're entitled to discovery on that under 1539C. Out of county warrants, um, I have a case like that right now. Um, did you know that your magistrate can only uh, sign warrants for his or her county um, unless there's some limited exceptions? Um, so if you see that a Contra Costa judge signed a warrant for Alameda County or San Francisco or whatever, that should, you should definitely look into that. Um, and so I'm gonna pass this on to Ashley. Now, let's see. Okay, stop share. There you go. Hello, everybody. Sorry I was late. Uh, I'm in the midst of a board deer in Stockton, and so we got let out. I ran over, and I'll have to slip out at about 10 past to get back on time. But I have a exciting suppression motion that comes up in cannabis cases most often, but is useful in any controlled substance case where the officer destroyed the actual controlled substance. So let me get here and... Here we go. Okay, so basically, if we go to the health and safety code, it controls how different controlled substances are allowed to be forfeited or disposed of. 
I don't know if it happens frequently to you guys that whenever you're in this case with a controlled substance, suddenly there just is not this substance around anymore. It doesn't matter that it is the crux of the case. It has been destroyed. Now, if you look through the code, and I kind of break it down here, Division 10, Chapter 8, there are several code sections that talk about when things are allowed to be destroyed. And that is when they are unlawfully held. The complication with cannabis is that cannabis is not per se unlawful to possess. And more than that, there is not an amount that is per se unlawful to possess. A patient is permitted to have as much medicinal cannabis as is reasonably related to their ongoing needs. This did change with Prop 64, despite the purchase limits placed on medicinal cannabis patients, their possession rights were not changed. So if you go through the code, there's all the, it can be destroyed if there's a conviction. So long as you have a court order, it can be disposed of by a court order if it resolves not with a conviction, unless the court finds it was lawfully possessed, or there are several circumstances where it can be summarily forfeited. But notice that the only ways it can be destroyed here is with a court order after the resolution of the case. That is where there is statutory basis for a judge to order the destruction of a controlled substance. Even judges need a lawful basis for their orders. They can't just say what is and is not allowed to be done. So, while well, they can destroy contraband, they being law enforcement, Health and Safety Code 11361.1 states that cannabis and cannabis products that uh, in, in involved any way with conduct deemed lawful by this section are not contraband. And so they can't just be grouped in with this controlled substances are contraband concept, even though cannabis is considered a Schedule One. So in order to destroy it, you have to have a court order. They can only be made with a legal basis and the legal basis for this destruction only exists after the case because we and our clients are due basic due process. They can't just say it. But there is one exception and it is the one that I'm here to talk about. Health and Safety Code 11479 allows for the destruction of controlled substances if there are more than 10 pounds of it, or in the case of cannabis, more than two pounds or the amount that a patient is permitted to have via local ordinance. I actually think that a local ordinance stating how much a patient would be allowed to possess would be unconstitutional based upon people v. Kelly, um, but we haven't had to get to that yet. Um, but what we then see is that destruction still shall not take place until the following requirements are satisfied. And that is a shall, not if they're into it, if it's okay, you know, no, it's shall not take place until these requirements are followed. And it says until all of them are followed. So what does law enforcement actually have to do to destroy this substance? I'm going to talk specifically about cannabis here. Um, in my examples, the code section does apply to controlled substances of any type, as well as growing cannabis and harvested cannabis as separate entities defined in the section. Um, but because cannabis is the situation where if it's being charged criminally, they almost definitely, they almost always have over two pounds and cops love destroying cannabis, particularly when they eradicate gardens. So requirement 1A, this is the actual language. I've made these slots very robust because I wanted to make sure that everybody has the code language and case law to actually use to create motions based on this section. I'm not going to read all of it to you. I just figured it was the most um, helpful way to actually get all that information to everyone here. Uh, the basics of requirement one is that they have to take samples. They have to have a two pound sample of cannabis. The section says 10 pounds for other 
controlled substances plus five random and representative samples elsewise. You'll generally see this as officers taking a 10 pound sample of cannabis. This is their kind of lip service to 11479, even though they don't realize what they're doing. To do this, like I said, you have to take the 10 pound sample um, and five random samples for controlled substances or a two pound sample and five random samples for cannabis. So that is uh, whatever a two pound sample would be. Uh, it's allowed to be stalks, branches, leaves, etc. Random samples are leaves or buds. Note that this does not include roots or dirt or anything like that. Cops love weighing root balls and including that in the weight of substance taken because it adds poundage. The next section is photographs and videos that reasonably and accurately demonstrate the total amount of the substance destroyed. Now the requirement for videos was added in 2015 specifically, and I always argue that this addition was made because law enforcement can do these videos. We all carry video recorders with us everywhere right now when we have our phones and there is no reason that law enforcement can't do a walk and a plant count if they're eradicating a garden. Um, and that this was added in shows that the legislature believes that there is also a need. It's not photographs or videos, it's photographs and videos. So they need to show what was actually destroyed, right? I generally say that we need to know how much was destroyed because this is the size of the plants, right? They can't just give us a plant count. They have to show us how big these were, how big the plants are, are going to impact the potential yield. What was the health of these plants, right? Knowing how much was destroyed is going to make sure that we can actually get a good idea of what this cannabis garden looked like. Requirement three is the gross weight of the controlled substance. And here the legislature gave the officers two different choices. They can actually weigh it, which would be the most helpful, or they can just put it in a pile and measure it. Like that's really a low burden. You don't even have to have special equipment. Like just put it all in a pile and measure it so that then we can estimate how much it is. Um, I find that helpful when talking about what they need to do because it really is a low burden at that point. Um, any, any disposal that happens at a dump is easy to argue that a truck can be weighed before and after. That's how the cost of what you're disposing is generally determined. So if they had kept just basic records, we would have this. Requirement four is that the chief of law enforcement make some kind of determination that it can't be kept in place uh, where it is and there are different things that can be considered. Now it's important that this has to be the sheriff of the county or chief of police, right? This is the chief of law enforcement. This isn't a author on the case. These are determinations that are supposed to be made at the top. Um, so if they were never contacted if there's no standing policy, then there is no way for this need to be met. Fun fact to look out for, there is case law out there that says that a good reason not to store cannabis is because stored cannabis sometimes spontaneously combusts. Uh, that's case law, that cannabis occasionally just heats up and explodes. Um, I've never seen any kind of factual basis for that, but because there is case law, officers put it in their boilerplate. Um, fun cross-examination fodder, uh, especially cannabis, becomes less terrifying to everyone. Finally, the fifth requirement doesn't have a separate code section. It's not A, B, C, or D, but it lays out that an affidavit has to be filed within 30 days in the court where this court case would be. And so it has to be in the file because it is supposed to take the place of a court order to destroy it, right? We are making paperwork 
It's all about the paper trail and law enforcement has to follow those same rules. Like they are supposed to submit their search warrant return, this should be included with their return to the court because this is what allows a solid record to be kept. It has to include all the other information in it as well as the date and time of destruction. So this is supposed to be filed, right? There is no exception to this in any of the case law that they just don't have to follow this. But let's go through it a little bit. I apologize for erecting. Like I said, I'm gonna have to head out pretty soon. So what satisfies this requirement for law enforcement? Now we have some excellent law in People v. Wilson that this is a strict compliance law because these are statutory requirements with mandatory language. They are about the uh, keeping of evidence. They're very serious. So therefore it has to be strict compliance. But when are officers ever held strict compliance? So what we actually have is substantial compliance with this strict compliance standard, which really confuses their really confuses opposing counsel, really confuses us. Because what we end up with is you have to substantially comply with each requirement. So the statute has strict compliance, you have to meet all of those requirements, but you only need substantial compliance with each. And so there are some examples here of what was allowed as substantial compliance. You have things like representative sample isn't uh, defined, so what does that look like? So long as you have all the information, a filing delay is still substantial compliance since there was no prejudice in that delay. Um, and in fact, the prejudice issue is one that comes up in a twist in the case law. There is no explanation about prejudice, but it is in both Littlefield and Ekstrom. I have had this prejudice standard used to deny my motions before. Even though we had a garden destroyed, we had no way of figuring out how healthy these plants are, what their yield would be. We had no way of even really figuring out like how old they were, or how far out they were from harvest, but it was still used as a basis to deny because the judge found that there was no prejudice despite all of this destruction. As I've said, this is not a common motion. Um, trial courts uh, and pre-trial courts get really confused. Um, I've had multiple courts in a single case just on like, what are you bringing? What is this? But the number one question I always get asked, is this a trombetta? No, no, it's not a trombetta. It really isn't because we have a statute in the law that lays out what the duties are. We're not just looking at exculpatory evidence known to be exculpatory at the time destroyed, right? Uh, and whether bad faith was required or not. No, here we have a statute from the California legislature saying that it's an issue. However, there is some case law regarding a materiality concern being required Four and 11479. Essentially, the idea is that the evidence has to be material in order to be suppressed. And luckily, um, well, here, if you go through all of this, uh, like I said, I won't go through every single word here, but I wanted to give the good quotes for motions. It says that, you know, it has to be exculpatory at the time in order to be suppressed at all. But I mean, that's not exactly true if we look at young blood, right? And there are some situations where potentially useful information can be destroyed with bad faith. So there's an argument that some of this needs to be updated, but it hasn't been. 11479 case law is kind of behind its own time. So what I generally try and argue to the court uh, is that this is more of a statutory trombetta than it is just a case law trombetta. Essentially, you have the legislature laying out um, that these are the requirements that have to be followed to essentially create comparable evidence. You need to have the amount destroyed, pictures and videos, 
um, you know, or some kind of basis why was it, why it was destroyed. Essentially, they codified bad faith, right? And this shouldn't be hard for us to show that it's material because we have excellent case law that the quantity and quality of the contraband seized is always relevant to the issue of whether or not they're for sale or personal use, right? And so since cannabis doesn't even have a per se limit, it should always be relevant, it should always be material, and particularly in the instance of plants, the yield is always what's used by officers. Every plant here is gonna produce 10 pounds of cannabis that's sold at a million dollars a pound, and so this is a huge grow, right? So what kind of motion is it really? The issue is that the legislature created this guideline, but they provided no remedy in the section. So we bring it as a 1538.5. And that's because of destruction of um, controlled substances in violation of health and safety code section 479 is found to be a due process violation under the state and federal constitutional standards. And it's clear throughout the case law, the action motion is the mechanism to bring this with. So we're in 1538.5 land. Unfortunately, it is very uncommon to get these actually granted. As I said, I've had prejudice standards thrown at me. I've had uh, samples found um, years later just suddenly show up when I bring these motions. I've gotten great offers though, when they find that I can show that their officer was dishonest in the filing of this affidavit or if this affidavit exists. Um, you'd be surprised how often people find this affidavit years later or you know, months and months later, uh, just when you file your motion. When it doesn't work, I just do 1538.5i. Right, so we get a second shot at a 1538.5. Uh, 1538.5i is only for felonies, right? It's pro post, well, or indictments. So post prelim felonies or indictments. You can renew that motion uh, for a special hearing. If you brought the 1538.5 at prelim, um, obviously if you haven't brought it, you can just bring it. But this applies to cases that um, not only have felt like are charged as felonies, but those cases that also have felonies co-charged with misdemeanors. So if you have your uh, conspiracy to commit a crime, or if you have your misdemeanor, your cannabis misdemeanors paired with um, felon in possession of a firearm or anything like that. Basically what you get at the second shot, if you would, is you have the transcript of the preliminary hearing and evidence that couldn't be reasonably presented at the preliminary hearing, except that the people can recall witnesses who tested at the preliminary hearing or if everybody agrees. Um, and then the, the court bases it on that, right? Uh, from there, you can also writ that second hearing if you want, but I believe Kiana had some excellent points on that, if not already done, and I missed them at the beginning. She has some other information. So that, is the basic 11479 information. I know I just threw that all at you guys. I apologize, I'm in hyped uh, court mode still. But it is really an excellent kind of hard and fast way. Um, Telling Weiss has had some lead missed with this. We taught Trinity County that they have to file these. Uh, you'll now find that Trinity County files 11479 affidavits. Um, different counties have different reactions to it, and if only to show the prosecutor and the judge that you are the authority on what can and cannot be done with the substance, um, I find that they, they do impact how the case is treated, even if they don't give suppression, because as Kiana is about to go into, it is... Uh, a pattern that at least we have observed, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you all talk about, uh, about the level of getting them granted, 
Again, I'm sorry that this is so fast with me and that I'm gonna have to head out, but does anybody have any questions about the 11479 process or anything about it before I go? And please, if anybody wants any of the information or to further talk about it, don't hesitate to reach out at another time as well. But does anyone have anything on it? Otherwise, I'll have to vamoose. No? Okay. Well, thanks, you guys. Uh, feel free to email me unless somebody just submitted one. Nope. Yeah, if anybody has anything, feel free to email me. Bye. Good luck in your trial. Good luck, Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Good luck. Okay, so um, this this presentation was kind of born out of a um, some comments, um, some expressions of um, frustration that I heard from Joe, um, and I totally, totally um, get where everybody's coming from. In fact, I did have a conversation with some practitioners who also echoed those same sentiments um, that you know. It just seems like these motions are not getting granted, even when you know they're very meritorious. And so we kind of want to address that and try to come up with what are what are some things that you can do about that. Um, you can cry. I mean that's that's one of them. But um, you know there are some other tools in your tool belt maybe that you could use in addition to crying. Um, so what a lot of people don't know is that you can do a pretrial appeal in misdemeanor cases to the denial of your 1538.5 motion as long as you made the motion no later than 45 days after arraignment. This is where a lot of people go wrong is because they don't file it within 45 days of arraignment. Um, and so you want to make sure you do that. Just do it in every case because you just don't know what's going to happen. So make sure to review your discovery in a timely fashion. Do it in every case. Obviously, sometimes if you're taking over a case from someone else that didn't do it, then you're kind of screwed. Um, but if you, can, if you have the control of that, then make sure you do it and then file your notice of appeal within 30 days after the denial of the motion. And those are the statutes listed there. Um, if the motion is brought at preliminary hearing, file a 995 within 60 days of arraignment on the information, um, not on the complaint, on the information and then file a writ of mandamus within 15 days after your ruling on your 995, assuming that it's, it's denied. I have one, uh, my um, 995s based on um, 1538s that I ran or other issues that I ran, um, like the 1042 sub C issue that I talked about earlier. So um, you can win at the 995. You know, maybe you don't win at the hearing, but you win at the 995. But if not, then file your 995 or your writ of mandamus within 15 days after the denial of your 995. But writ review is discretionary. That's kind of the downside of any of these things. Um, if you make your post preliminary hearing um, 1538.5, a writ of mandamus, um, file that within 30 days after the denial, but review is also discretionary and that's under 1538.5 I. So that goes for what Ashley was talking about. Um, you can get your, you can do it twice. You know, you can do your 1538.5 um, at prelim and then you can do a post prelim, but they're subject to the, the limitations that she was going over. Um, and then file your writ at that point, or you can just do your 995, file your writ at that, or both. It, um, but some of those might be a little difficult with the, the time limits that are laid out here. Um, then there's also the post-conviction review. Right to appeal survives a plea under 1538.5M. There's a caveat for any of you who, who've done your work in Contra Costa, there's a big caveat that we'll be getting to in a moment. Um, Non-Fourth Amendment motions, they can be appealed post-conviction. So some of the motions that we were talking about, um, say motions to suppress a statement or whatever, you can't do anything about that unless your client is convicted. Those do not survive a plea, um, which is kind of why this, this next issue um, 
that we were going to talk about this whole idea of the appellate waiver in Contra Costa um, really complicates our ability to, to really deal with any of these issues. Um, so what we wanted to do is um, stop the recording and then have a little bit of a discussion since we have some um, practitioners here and, and kind of brainstorm some ideas that Joe and I had talked about and see if anybody else has additional ideas about how to deal with some of these challenges if none of these things are practical or, or work in your situation.